Good morning, everybody. We are live. We're ready to go. Let's see what's up. Let's see what's happening. Let's see what people are on about. God, I got the funniest message last night from uh, Gord Laws at like nine o'clock. He's um he says to me, dude, you have to listen to this. Um, <laughs> and it's a recording of us from like 2019, probably April of that year. That's like three years ago. And he says, um, this is the best thing ever. And it was that whole decimal Dan thing. You know, they've just changed our money again. So we've got new banknotes and new coins. And uh, this was a, a recording. I mean, we were, it was, I think it was me and Gordon Ben on the show that day because it sounds like it's just the three of us. And we're busy laughing about this song that they made in the, must have been the 1950s or something, when they changed the uh, South African currency from the, the pond to the rond. The pound to the rand, and it was uh, it's pretty hilarious. I listened for like a good 15 minutes, uh, <laughs> it sounded like a lot of fun. So, we are still here and we're still having lots of fun. And this morning, none other than the great Pumi Mashiko. Hello, Pumi. Yay. Yay, when my father sent me a voice note singing that song in Zulu no. with the new. <laughs> I've got a voice You're note joking. of my singing that song oh, no. <laughs> Friday morning it was so because obviously they would have had to um, make a version in every language because back then right. there was a radio Zulu, radio Venda all of that and they had back to tell in, the people in, we had a disgusting apartheid government but man there were those tunnies who got things done so they sent out memos to all the other tunnies and then the tunnies received the memos and they were like where is the Zulu version of the decimal dance song? The Zulu people are waiting for their song. You know, now we can't even get textbooks to Limpopo. I mean, it's oh ridiculous. My God. It really it's is. so funny that you brought... <laughs> and I didn't know what this is. My dad has never sent me a voice note, ever. I get a oh, voice yeah. note. And I click on this. I'm thinking, what's it? My dad must have learned... Get this voice notes. I click on this thing. I'm like, oh, you learned a new thing. And it's him singing this. Well, <laughs> it's so funny, though, that we've, you know, we've, we've almost in some ways we've gone backwards because now we don't, do, we don't do any public service announcements or any of that stuff around, you know, new money or any of the things that are happening. Oh my God, I've got a clip later on for the burning platform with uh, Sputla Ramahopa. He was on with, he was on with uh, Sakina. And she just, I mean, she's so, you know, really, I, I didn't understand or rate Sakina very, very highly before I'm, because I don't ever watch her, because she's on at the same time we're on. Yes. So I never really saw her. And then I met her at a, at a dinner probably about two years ago. And I thought, what an awesome woman this is. And I mean, I kind of, I knew her name, obviously. I knew she was. I thought, what an awesome woman this is. I've got to make an effort. So now I watch like clips when I can and people send me clips of her. And that's very cool. So of I, get, I get to see her more often, Sakina. And she was on with Sputla Ramachopa. And it's just, he's such a, he's such a nothing. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, we won't, we won't start down the path that we started yesterday where we Ended up talking about the electricity minister for like a good ten minutes, and it no, we're ask. not talking about the electricity minister. Yes, no, <laughs> you know, the, I saw a speaking of public service announcements. I saw a public service announcement on my timeline yesterday by the FBI. Oh, a, about what to do should you ever be in an active shooter um, situation. I was like, I, first of uh, all, I watched the whole thing and it's about four minutes long. Are you wondering what you have to do? You no, have to I, run, hide, or fight back, but only as a last resort. And then you must gang up on the shooter. Oh, my God. Okay, first of all, thanks very much, FBI. We don't, we don't need that because this isn't America. And I think our, our numbers for, for, for school shootings or any other kinds of, uh, you know, Shooting incidents are quite low, actually. Listen, it's it, it is 
the fact that they need a pub, public service announcement is crazy, right? Mm. It, it it's a whole. It it looks like a scene out of a series because obviously, it, I mean, they do this well. It's very well shot. It's the acting mm. is amazing. All of those things, and then every now and again, the person will stop and look at the camera. And it's like. I can hear the conspiracy theorists saying, yeah, like they, when they made the fake moon landing or when they faked JFK's assassination or Jack Ruby, or, you know, I can hear them. Yo, the FBI are really good at faking this stuff. They've been in the movie business for years. But I've been listening to a podcast, Gareth. I've been listening to a podcast with an ex-FBI agent and she worked oh, yeah. in a division that, 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 goes after the money. So after the criminal enterprise, when the FBI gets you, right? She worked oh. in the division that goes after the money, the recovery. Nice. And this whole um, series, this this whole um, podcast series is about kleptocrats from around the world. Ooh. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, oh, nice. Kleptocrats. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, kleptocrats a, from I think sunny it was our own uh, – hang yeah. on, our own David Bullard. Do you remember David Bullard used to write for the Sunday Times? Yes, I remember um, uh, David famously, Bullard. And, and was, was sacked for writing something politically incorrect, which was probably true. Anyway, uh, David Bullard coined the term kleptocrat here in South Africa because I think he was the first one to, to, to widely use it in his column. When he was describing the thieves in the ANC, he was saying these are the these are kleptocrats. That's our form of government. You know, you get an oligarchy, you get a monarchy, you get a democracy, you get uh, a kleptocracy. And he called South Africa a kleptocracy. He was spot on, like kleptomaniac. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. But it is hectic. That it is. Very hectic, but this this lady that is the the main person she used to work for the FBI. She left, I think, in twenty fifteen. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and all this, she says. First of all, she says, if you um, were to follow her on the job, most times it's the most boring thing ever. You know, so all the stuff that we see about the FBI is obviously all the exciting stuff laid up next to each other. She says her life was not right. like. Um, 24 it's definitely not like that it's definitely you know, she spends most of her time combing through state bank statements trying to follow the money you know where the money was spent by whom and whatnot and obviously you think she would a be, lot you think she would be helpful here yay yay <laughs> well she she does say that the, there's two things that happens to the money. It gets squandered, so on breast implants and probably now BBLs and champagne and, and that kind of stuff, and that they can't recover because she doesn't want the breast implants. But there's also mansions and yachts and cars and, and <laughs> all of that kind of stuff, and that they can recover. And I listened to an episode about her going after Sunny Abacha's millions. Uh, mm. For those of you who don't know, he's a former general who um, staged a coup in Nigeria. That's right. Big this deal. I didn't know, that he died in a Viagra and drug-fueled orgy with prostitutes. Sounds good. Sounds like a good way to go. Yay! But... Uh, <laughs> But I'm horrified. You, you, I stand amazed. Pumi, you're telling me that if someone has had a breast implant on, on stolen money, you can't get the breast implant back? You can't claim that back? I, you you really. probably could, but what will you do with it? <laughs> what will you do with it? <laughs> I would love, I'd love to see, the I'd love to see like our, whatever's left of our NPA going after someone's fake breast <laughs> implants in South Africa. <laughs> Well, they'd have to go after the BBLs because that's what a lot of the, the slay queens are into. They're not into the breast implants. It's the BBL, baby. No, for sure. <laughs>
All right. Well, we've got a couple of very important issues to deal with in the comment section. So let's start off right there. Um, I heard something really nefarious yesterday, says Ruth, about the government toggling water and electricity to get rid of certain unwanted elements in the city of Joburg. If they can do that to them, they can do it to them. That sounds like conspiracy nonsense to me, Ruth, but you know what? What, But what does that mean? (laughs) I think that, between that she, water and electricity, uh, they are it everyday reality. Yeah, she, but she th- seems to think there's some kind of uh, draconian plan to, like, I don't know whether it's to punish the homeless or to punish people in suburbs or I don't know what it is. But it sounds like a conspiracy theory. Me, listen, we're all dealing with this. I saw someone yesterday. We had a little event at Cliff Central, and and uh, we had I don't know probably about eighty people there. It was very cool. And um, we had some entertainment and we showed people around. It was really, it wasn't even our party. It was a party for the, uh, the venues that we, that we share with this, um, this awesome place that we've moved into. And one of the women there said to me, apparently yesterday was the worst or, or Tuesday was the worst. We had 11 and a half hours um, across the board of no power. So stupid me, I know, stupid me. I, I got home yesterday afternoon. I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll make this for supper or whatever. Now, I don't usually think about supper until the last minute, but you have to plan ahead these days. So then what I did is I looked at the clock and I thought, okay, well, load shedding started at four. So it should be over by like 6.30. (laughs) Stupid me. It wasn't. It was until 8.30. So I, I was busy doing work and trying to get other things sorted out. And I was like, were you I, were you chopping? Were you prepping to make yourself? <laughs> well, it wasn't complicated. I just had to cook something on the stove. But of course, my stove doesn't connect to uh, the solar because it would just deplete it in a minute. And I had to wait until half past eight. So I ate really late all on my own. It was kind of pathetic. Oh. I sat there like <laughs> oh. <laughs> eating all on my own. It was so sad and stupid. But it was later than usual. So it wasn't like I was watching TV or doing other things at the same time. I was just like, okay, cook, eat, go to bed. It was pathetic. It really oh. was. Oh. So um, I don't know what the story is, whether it's the worst it's ever been. I'm not sure. Uh, but there is this graph, which I'll show you in a minute or two. Congo Chris says, what do you guys think Gareth uses on his hair? It hasn't changed since the 90s. <laughs> well... <laughs> I, haven't used the same, I haven't used the same stuff since the 90s the 90s were very much about like hair gel and moose and moose and shit right and that was expensive because it was i i've never had long hair i've never had long and i see you you sporting a new hairstyle Pums. this is um, why we were late this morning kids it takes a uh, little bit longer to get the fro in, <laughs> in <laughs> and and Nabang also had a new hairstyle this week. So we're all, everybody's changing for the new month. Anyway. Um, Everybody out, get busy. I don't, I don't think there's a serious answer to this question. So I'm not even going to bother with it, Chris. But like, I, I used to how, use, Okay, here's, here's the thing that maybe you can tell us. How much do you spend on hair products? Oh, please. No, not a lot at all. So I can go <laughs> through, I can go through one little thing of, it's like a wax uh, or, or a, yeah, something like that. Um, and that'll cost, it's expensive, but it'll last me three and a half months. What? Whenever, whenever my hair gets longer than that, I have to go and have it cut. So, because it drives me crazy. If it takes me more than two minutes in the morning to get ready with my hair, it's too long. Wow. So One now, of the biggest. I usually do when it's long is I put in, I can't believe we're even talking about this. I, I get. I've got this stuff. It's almost like a leave-in conditioner. They love the hair, Gareth. They love but the it, hair. Um, it smells so nice. It smells like minty. So I like put this stuff in, and that's all I use sometimes. You know, black hair care is one of Ooh. the biggest industry sectors Ooh. in the world. Lots well, of money spent on on hair care. Isn't that one of the areas that Herman Mashaba made his fortune in? <laughs> There's another. <laughs> no. I'm just asking. Well, no, I mean, listen, you said it's a big industry. Tell you what, that it continues to be a big industry. The beauty industry is enormous across the board. Like uh, something in the uh, out of the top 12 richest people in the world, like four of them are 
the children of people who launched beauty products, you know, the, the Estee Lauder empire or the, um, whatever it is. I mean, th mm. those people, those people have made an absolute killing. So it continues to be one of the most brilliant business areas to get into. That's why they're also all these, all these, um, these people who sell door to door and their pyramid schemes. And, you know, they do that with the makeup. They do it with the makeup as well. It's a big this deal. Is, this is true. In fact, uh, you say um, Avon was mm. one of the, maybe it was the third kind of business misadventure I've had when I was in high school. Yeah. Was selling Avon. Made Ooh. lots of money on Avon. I actually Did made you? lots of money. Oh, I made lots of money on Avon. Oh, well done, Pum. So you're the only person it, I've ever met who did. Oh, but I was also in high school. So lots of money is relative, right? When you're in high school. <laughs> all I needed, all I needed was just money to go to the movies, money to hang out with friends. But I made I made good money. Okay. On Avon. Right. On Avon, I was not like so. When I arrived here this morning, Ryan looks so cool, guys. I I wish you could see his outfit, I, and I'm sure he'll post it on whatever social medias he's on. He looks so cool. He he looks like, and you know, the coolest person in my life is Ganejo, right? Yeah. Because he he's like, and when I arrived, Ryan like looked like Ganejo. He looked like Kanejo. He had the hair, he had the, the jacket, the t shirt, oh, the man. sneakers. The, so, Kanejo is the one that needs to make lots of money because I can't afford those clothes that he needs. Yeah. Can't afford the sneakers, can't afford the. So, he needs, he needs to get a job. Richard says, uh, You were on top of the pyramid with Avon. That's why you made money. Damn straight, nigga. Damn straight. She didn't mess around. Pumi, Pumi's not going to be in the middle or the bottom of the pyramid. Are you joking? If she starts a pyramid scheme, she's going to damn well be at the top. Dude, I was like, I was coining it. I was at the top of that pyramid and I had like people <laughs> underneath me in the pyramid. It was wonderful. Well, I'm glad you were. Tupperware Jehovah's Witnesses. Your yes, first job was, was a success, but mine was an absolute failure. I was a waiter. <laughs> I was, a, I was a waiter for all of like two and a half hours. and Oh, I realized, my goodness. You would suck at that. Of course I would. But you think you, th you would think I would know that. But I had no idea. I thought, oh, I'll give this a try. This shouldn't be too difficult. Of course, the service industries as a whole are exactly where you should not have me. I would be an unmitigated and was an unmitigated disaster in the service industry. Because all I could think about was, who are these morons who keep changing their orders how how dare they talk to me like this? Who the fuck are they? I I was like I was so not. There's not a there's not, an, old? there's not a cell in my body that could have stood being Goodness. in the service in. Oh my also, god! Also, you where you were sulking teenager. That's the other thing about back then. Like you're already a sulking teenager, and now you have to be nice uh, to people at their like spur uh, table, so, Mike's uh, kitchen. I wasn't a sulky teenager, but this guy, I'm, I'll never forget it because I even wrote about it in my book. He was this big... I remember man, this. And he, and he ordered a whiskey and water. And then I brought him a whiskey and water. He said, I ordered a whiskey and soda. And I said, no, you didn't. And he said, you don't talk to me like that. Call your manager. So I said, you know what? You call him and tell him I've left. <laughs> like, this is not going to work. <laughs> but this is not for me. Bagabantu is asking about the Tupperware bankruptcy filing. Have you spoken Ooh. about this with Lebang? No. no. You don't tell, know this? Of course I don't know this. How, how domesticated do you think I am? What, what happened with Tupperware and their bankruptcy? I heard that they're out of business, but did, did someone sue them for making a non-airtight uh, container? I mean, what happened here? Apparently, people aren't having Tupperware parties as they used to. So their no, sales... No. <laughs> you're joking. I mean, you, you're telling me that that staple of the social calendar, the Tupperware party, has fallen from grace? You're telling me that women in the 21st century haven't found better ways to entertain themselves other than sit around and swap Tupperwares at a fucking party? Buy them, buy the Tupperware rep around and say, oh, which one is best for storing eggs? Oh, my God. Listen, Tupperware is is a staple of, like, take home 
but goes from like events. No, we're not, and, we're not, we're not, we're not going down this road again because we had this discussion. <laughs> Mash, I'm sorry, Pumi, but Mash told us one morning at length how he and his, his mother indoctrinated him into the Tupperware world. And he has very, very strict rules about his Tupperware. He marks no. them. Oh, yeah. And he has matching like colors and si different sizes of Tupperware. And he takes it super seriously. So don't even, Listen, don't even but stop. He may think, you know, because Tupperware, like Colgate and um, <laughs> and Checkers Bag, all of those things are also oh. a little bit of a category name, right? right. So oh. Mash may say Tupperware, but I don't know if Mash has got like Tupperware, Tupperware, because Tupperware is expensive. <laughs> but also when the thing oh. came out, when the financials first came out, I mean, that's what they said. You know, that's what the... the um, so Tupperware, the company's from Orlando, Florida, mm -hmm. and they and that's what they spoke about. You know that they've had such sharp decline in sales, uh, almost eighteen percent year on year, because they are not connecting with young people. So if Mash has real Tupperware, Mash has probably got like some like Tupperware knockoff. <laughs> no, he, no. In fact, he does not because. He was very particular about when one of his friends or someone who came to his house took something home in a Tupperware and they didn't return the Tupperware. And he was less pissed off that they had taken away some food without his permission than he was about losing the Tupperware. So it was really his stuff he regards very highly. And it's probably expensive. Listen, although this is how expensive Tupperware is, although as they're talking about the company being in financial trouble, the financial trouble they're talking about is also the fact that they only made 1.3 billion US dollars in 2022. Yeah. Right. So it's it's not like they made 30 rand. 1.3 no, no. billion US dollars, which is an 18% decrease and that's why they're in trouble. You know why young people have uh, have abandoned Tupperware and and it's not a thing anymore. Let's let's just break this down because this could be interesting from a social point of view. First of all, I don't think people really believe in leftovers anymore because I don't think people make more than they absolutely have to. First of all, times are tough. So I don't mm. think people are, you know, before you would have thought, Ooh, well, they're, they're like six people coming. Let's do, oh, we've got a call. Pumi, do you want to take a call? I love the way what it comes. What is that through. sound? I love, I love the way it came through on the line. Yeah, who's this? <laughs> Hello. Good day. Hello, this is Errol, Errol from Durban. <laughs> Hey, Errol, Hello, go ahead. Errol from Durban. Go ahead. Okay. You know that uh, Joe Biden wants to run for another term? This guy, I mean, he will be about 86. Yeah, 86 when he finishes his term. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it'll be so soon as he'll start pushing the wrong button. Yeah. You know, right. starting a third world war. Yeah. Because he's in charge of the nuclear. Yeah. And, and you know what? Uh, he already has the nuclear codes, and I'm not so sure if you saw a press conference of his this week. He could hardly speak. He could hardly string two sentences together. The guy's basically already there. So, That's right. Yeah, and all right. Wants to run for the third oh. All right, well. Okay, go. <laughs> thank you, Errol. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. There's Errol. Hey, if you want to call us, you can get hold of us on 0832955769, just like that. Okay, so let's go into this Tupperware thing. So first of all, I don't think people order more than they have to, and people don't cook more than they have to, because they, they you know, there's no money going around. There's no extra money. Second thing is that people have become used to everything on demand. So why would you have leftovers when you can just get the new stuff, and it might even be cheaper? Listen, and third of all, third of although, all, I, I, yeah. I don't, think people, I don't think people have learned to save and look after and prolong the life of that. Nobody's teaching kids that stuff. No, but you know what? What a lot of, especially kind of like the super healthy vegan type, all of those guys, they're meal prepping, dude. They are meal prepping. No. They are on a Sunday chopping up all of the stuff, packing it in little putting it in there have you not seen that have that that Probably. requires tap away but the number of people who are actually doing that is very very small compared to the number of people who just eat and eat and eat and eat and have no plan at all so i don't think that those people in the majority <laughs> eat and eat and eat. 
if Tupperware is going to rely on them, they're in big trouble. Anyway, I can't believe I'm trying to defend the use of Tupperware on this uh, Thursday morning. It's the most ridiculous <laughs> conversation we've ever had. This is the us worst. having our own Tupperware party. This is this is it. I we've did, had a Tupperware party now. There we go. They owe us some, some of that 1.8 billion rand in profit. Um, Pumi, I did something so stupid on Tuesday. Um, I was in for a couple of meetings, and then in the afternoon I went and uh, went to gym, and I decided I was going to do leg day, right? What a terrible idea. <laughs> oh, my God. So for the last two nights, oh, Tuesday night and Wednesday night, last night, I could not sleep properly because my legs were so f- sore from training. I, I obviously haven't done a leg day in ages. It nearly killed me. I woke up like the whole way through the night with – it felt like I had, you know, those growing pains you have as a as a teenager when your muscles are sore. It's like that for two oh. solid nights. I completely overdid it. I think. I mean, I can walk, I can I can stand, I can run, but it's so goddamn sore. And and th- that r- resting like muscle pain. Oh, it's awful. So I would leg recommend to everybody. Not, but do not do leg. Just rather don't do leg day. Do the bare minimum. No. Don't skip leg day. Lean into the pain, Gareth. Lean no. into the pain. Don't skip no. leg day. Leg day is important. Otherwise, oh, you're no. going to look like Johnny Bravo. Mm-mm. Squats and lunges are horrible things, and nobody in the world should have ever come up with them. They are an absolute pain. Every part of them, everything about them is just awful. Johnny Bravo. Johnny okay. Bravo. That's that's uh, what you are setting yourself up to look like if you go to the gym and skip leg day. That's all I'm saying. Hey, Clint has a good suggestion here why Tupperware is not doing so well. Cheap Chinese plastic is the reason no one buys Tupperware. Maybe that's right. All those knockoffs. It's true. It is no. true. There, there, there are lots of uh, new players in the market. Definitely lots of cheap Chinese uh, knockoffs. But yes. also... Again, because we live in, in an instant world, it's it's also all of those little styrofoam things or those foil type things that yeah. you can just buy 20 of those and then throw them away. Like people, Correct. the throwaway generation is also what we are, you know? That's it. That want, it is. That's the reason. Squats well. are so painful. <laughs> yeah, squats are so painful, says Kareem. Karina is spot on. Ugh, they're the uh, worst. K- KB is more spot on. He says you look like a stock sweet. <laughs> you skip leg day. Oh, man. Uh, Nico quite rightly points out when you have done leg day, you need the disabled toilets for those sore legs. You need like a <laughs> handle on the wall. No, seriously, because <laughs> just sitting down is so painful. It's awful. Um, Epsom salts, people saying you just take magnesium. See, we get all these useful... Just uh, eat a banana. Is that, is that all you need to do? Yeah, eat some bananas. That, that helps. That's some motherly advice. Thank you, Pums. <laughs> and do another leg day, obviously. Oh, God, another one. What, today? <laughs> when did you do it? On Tuesday. Tuesday, yeah. Tomorrow. Oh, Oh no, this sounds like a punishment, really. Okay, so it's that or stock sweet. It's that or stock uh, sweet. Decide. Stock sweet's starting to sound like the option. All right, so <laughs> there are a couple of news headlines that uh, you may or may not have picked up on. The board of ESCOM seems to think that victim points are even more important than we already know. So many idiots in this world think victim points are because they are worried. That Dereta, Andre Dereta, the former CEO of ESCOM, is being portrayed as a victim, and this bothers them. So, uh, someone at the Parliament Standing Committee on Public Accounts had to listen to this nonsense. The ESCOM board chairperson, Mpoma Kwana, said that the company's former CEO was being portrayed as a victim after his explosive television interview about corruption at ESCOM. Now, I don't know how much you have to do these days to be qualifying as a victim, but if someone poisons your coffee and tries to kill you, I think you could claim victim, victimhood for that, for whatever it's worth. I've never wanted to claim victimhood, but if Andre Dorator wants to take it for a poisoned coffee, 
You can, right? Look, I so can. You know, every time I think about, like, oh, do you know what all these people are doing in all these talk, 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 talk? Is they're not fixing the problem. They're distracting themselves and distracting us and they're looking back instead of going. So here we are. What do we need to do going forward? That's Can I just problem. ask you, have you seen what Mpomakwana looks like? <laughs> no, really. Is there something new about what he, he looks like? Does he look laughing? sick? No, he, he looks like a child. It's the weirdest thing. Let me find you. Let me find your picture. Him because... I know what Mpomakwana looks like. Oh my God. Don't you think he looks like a child? Come on, it's not just me who thinks so. He looks like a, you know, uh, remember that that uh, TV show Webster? There was that kid in it. Um, oh. who was? He looks like Webster. I'm serious. That's what he looks like. He doesn't look like a. a he, he looks almost like he's been photoshopped. Like a child's head has been photoshopped Mar into an adult body. Gareth, man, Gareth, I'm not, man. I'm not being unkind. Let me show you this picture, and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> look at this guy. This is the guy. Look, <laughs> this is the guy who's complaining about <laughs> about how the rate is the victim. I mean, look at him. He's something's wrong there. Forces birth. I mean, what's going on? He's got like this <laughs> this little kid face. <laughs> this is the this is the chairperson of ESCOM. By the way, do we know anything about Mpoma Kwana and what he did to get the job of ESCOM chair? Do we? Um Mpoma Kwana. Let's see. Okay, so he, <laughs> apparently he was at the city of Johannesburg. Um as the founder and chairman of Epitome Investments. Okay, so, <laughs> or he probably calls it Epitome Investments. Mara Gareth, hi, 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 hi. Out of order, out of order. You are out of order with that one. Stop it. Out of order, Baba. Read so yourself worked, in. <laughs> he worked. He worked at the city of Johannesburg, and he says he has experience in corporate strategy, board directorship. Huh. You have, you have experience in board directorship, huh? Well, we've got to handle, we've got to give you all the, the controls then. Um, scenario thinking, corporate affairs and branding. Ay, 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 ay. No, but it, you must, if, if you, if you actually really want to see all of his credentials and stuff, you know, he has a personal website, not oh, a really? LinkedIn, not a LinkedIn. Oh. He has a personal website that's all about him, Poma Kwana. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Would you, would, you tell us, would you give us that website address? It's, maybe? it's lion3.co.za. L-I-O-N-3. Yeah. The official website of Mpomagwana. Okay, I can't wait. Oh, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the official website of Mpomakwana. Oh, guys, I gotta I gotta take a screenshot of this and show you. It's so good. <laughs> you can contact him there. How about everybody who listens to the show sends him an email and says, Hey, what are you doing at ESCOM? Hmm. What are you what are you gonna do there for us? No, and it's, not, it's... Don't be aggressive. Let's just find out what he's doing. Because like, do I mean even though you may think Mpo looks like a child, but Mpo is actually he's a, he's a grown man with 30 years experience in lots of different things. Lots of different things. Okay. So, like what? Strategy. Yeah, whatever that means. Management. People hide, people hide behind bullshit words, hey? So it says here he's an accomplished business leader with diverse experience over 31 years. Twenty. So he's old. He looks like that and he's He's had 30 years experience. He looks like he's only been in the business world for only five years. Anyway, he was non-executive chairman of Ned Bank. Ned Bank. This, this one's guy, a good one. If he, ends up saving, if he ends up saving ESCOM, Ned Bank can claim it. But if he's useless at, at, at ESCOM, then he was probably useless at Ned Bank as well. Do you think um, he was do you do you think he was instrumental in the awarding of Ned Bank some of that um th them being able to be part of alternative solutions 
for power solutions for homeowners, getting their accreditation to wow. do. You, do you think you help them do that? No, I don't know. <laughs> I, what do I know? I mean, <laughs> I, just, I marvel at at how people appoint these boards in the first place. Anyway, he's pissed off because he reckons the rater is a victim. And they should stop portraying him that way. I don't know who he's actually angry about, whether it's the rater or whether it's the media or whatever. But um, he says it is presumptive to assume that the rater would have shared the intelligence report with the board, given it was done clandestinely and outside board protocol. Well, it's because there were crooks on the board who were making it more difficult. We, we heard that. We have no reason to disbelieve it. It doesn't look like but- it was run very well. But the former board chairperson um, said that he knew that this was being um, commissioned. So then, and and even though he's never seen the report, right? So this is Mokoba, M- Professor Mokoba, mm-hmm. Makoba, Malikapuru. He said <laughs> that he knew that it was it was being commissioned. He knew, um, and and that because there was so much um, skullduggery, it had to be done. Uh, under wraps, but he knew that it was being done, and he was the he was the chairperson at the time of commission. So, all right. Well, I'm going to call him the the not the chairman, but the chair child because he looks he looks like a Hi, man. The chair child. Oh, that's what we, that's I need what a gavel gonna... here. I need a he gavel here in the studio Adby because you not... need to be called to order. Adby is right though. He does look like Leon Schuster doing blackface. I mean, that's a very good. Look, he does. It's that's incredible. That's so right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's just move on because I don't think we're going to get anywhere in this one. So okay. here's a really more important. news articles. This is very important for me. Would you pay one point two million rand to get the platinum table at the EFF ten year celebrations and sit with Julius Malema? One point two mil. Well, apparently it? somebody already has. Correct. Somebody has. Do we know who this person is? No. Who might that person be? Who could it be? Oh, it we be? will find Someone out. Someone in, in the illegal cigarette business? Hmm. <laughs> I suppose. Will we find out, though? Because obviously they'll they'll allow cameras in. Will we be able to see who's sitting at what table? We'll be able to see. I want to know who you, the people The people are. who will be sitting at the table with Julius. Those yes. are the people who will have paid the... The people closest to the ear of the CIC. So in a tweet posted on Tuesday, he announced the table at which he is the host where he will interact with the 10 people who bought seats and he said it was sold out. So it might not have been one person who paid 1.2 million, as I understand it. It could just be, it, you know, 100,000, 100,000, 100,000. 100,000, 120,000, 120,000 each sitting well, there. Listen to this. Uh, those who seated next to Malema will not only be treated to welcome drinks with the top officials of the party. Oh, well, that's what I've been waiting for. You know, you couldn't pay me 100000 to go and spend the whole evening with these people. Anyway, uh, they'll also get their company logo displayed on a screen at the gala dinner. Oof, such value. Such value. Um, they will also have branding opportunities at the venue. And Listen we'll here. VIP I don't know how many people... We don't know where the venue is. Hey, we, do we know where the venue is? We don't know where the venue is and we don't know how many people are going to be there. But what I do know is that those guys with their branding opportunity and their like welcome drinks, there are people at the back, people who are sitting over there, yes. will be paying 100000 for mm-hmm. their table. Yeah. You're over there, far away. You can right. maybe barely make out that there's Juju and the over so there. Us, okay, but let me be clear. To us, it sounds like a lot of money. But if yeah. you're crooked, if you're a crooked politician and you need to have EFF influence in government, this is nothing. This is like paying petty change, petty Listen cash. Listen here, more dollars arrived here in the comments this morning. All chirpy. I'm the first one in the comments. You probably bought that table mo dollars if you're out well, there with the mo dollar you uh yeah i don't think that's the mo dollar you're thinking of there Paul. i know but, it's not i know but, it's not but sanele sanele makes a good point uh paul the chairperson of escom is a latweezy chairboy <laughs> <laughs> 
he he really should he shouldn't put his picture on the internet. He, we, we should have to we should have to search for a long time before we find a picture of him. If and I look like that, I would be on the internet. And then he might actually have to find himself at a at a restaurant telling people, "Do you know who I am?" Because yes. they won't know who he is. That's why his pictures must be there. People must know. You must when you walk, <laughs> he must walk into oh. places, and they must know who he is. All right. How- well. A baby was born from three people's DNA in a UK first. Now, don't get too excited about this. I'll explain what happened because it doesn't actually mean three people's DNA went into creating a baby. Then it would be a mutant. It would be a complete disaster. So it wasn't to try and get a thruple to have their own kid either. Okay. (laughs) What they did here is that there was a huge uh, chance of mitochondrial disease, which, of course incurable and can be fatal within days or even hours of birth. Some families have lost multiple children. The technique is seen as an only option for them to have a healthy child of their own. So of course the mitochondria live in the cell so they're provided by the woman in this case because the sperm only contains the DNA from the male half. Um, the, the cell will always be female and therefore the mitochondria will always be female. That's why mitochondrial DNA tell you who your female, 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 female ancestor is all the way back. In other words, that cell comes from your grandma and from her her mother and from her mother and so on going back along the female line. Um, defective mitochondria fail to fuel the body and lead to brain damage, muscle wasting, uh, heart failure, and blindness. So they're only passed down by the mother. So mitochondrial donation treatment is a modified form of IVF that uses, uses mitochondria from a healthy donor egg. So essentially, it's just like... wow. <laughs> normal two-person situation, but there's 0.1% of the DNA that comes from a third donor. And that donor would be the mitochondrial DNA donor. And what they do, they go into the cell and they introduce this mitochondrial DNA to a healthy cell which has unhealthy mitochondria. Wow. And then that's how they get the 0.1%. So you can see scientists... You know, the headlines are very misleading. There are people all over the world thinking, oh, good. Now my, my threesome, my thruple, you know, my, my blended family, uh, all, these, all these terms that we're using, my modern family of me and my lover and my other lover, we can have a kid and we each can contribute 33.3% of the DNA. Nonsense. It's still going to be two people's DNA, but essentially they'll change the mitochondrial DNA for healthy stuff. We are a long way from Dolly. A long, long way from Dolly, hey? Yeah, it does not constitute a third parent. You find this buried right down in the article uh, from the BBC. Right at the bottom, they say, it was pioneered in Newcastle and laws were introduced to allow the creation of such babies in 2015. So it's not even new. But they said the, the important thing here is it does not constitute a third parent. The donor DNA is only relevant for making effective mitochondria and it does not affect other traits in the child, such as appearance. So before you get wow. really excited and uh, enthusiastic about this, you need to know that uh, it's, it's mostly just you know, smoke and mirrors. Um, I wonder if they'll be selling mitochondrial DNA at the EFF's 100th, uh, 10th birthday because then it might be worth some people getting uh, you know, some healthy mitochondrial DNA certainly seems to me they've got a lot of unhealthy DNA in that party anyway uh, one other story that I'd want to throw out here is that you know we often talk about how men have it easy compared to women and some people argue that that's not true you know men are the ones you have to go to war they do all the hard jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. but the truth is like when it comes to having kids there's no biological clock for men Robert De Niro has just welcomed his <laughs> Seventh child at the I age of this. 79. He's 79 years old and he just had his seventh baby, Robert. Yo! How's you that? Know, it, I, I saw this and I was just like, the Zulu saying is, you're creating orphans. Because. Right. 79 because... year old. Robert De Niro running around after a five-year-old kid. Do you see that happening? No, but I don't think that was ever going to happen. I think he's, <laughs> you know, he's going to employ he's going to employ people to look after the kid. He's a very, very wealthy, very successful actor. He's as grumpy as hell. I mean, 
Robert De Niro has been grumpy all of his life. And for him to now have to deal with a one-year-old or, or an infant, it's going to be horrible for the infant. Not uh, worse for him, but I mean, I think it's going to be the worst for the, for the kid. What? Why? Why? Why do you think? Because that's the first thing I thought of is why do you think he he felt uh, he wanted another child or needed another child? Like what in the hell? At seventy nine years old, I just want to be drinking gin and tonic at ten in the morning. Maybe, maybe his wife wanted another child. You know, she's considerably younger than him and we don't know i mean I, I can't i don't see the reason he's already got six kids so it's not as if he hasn't got any and he you know he wanted to produce a you know a, some kind of descendant uh here he's got six already he's going for the seventh I, I don't understand this but at the same time i'm kind of i'm in awe because the energy that it takes <clears throat> to be a parent you know for me I mean, it's really hard work. I was having this conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and he said, what is the likelihood really of you know, anyone in their 40s even becoming a father? But it's way higher than being in your 70s. It's hey, almost eight. Man. Why do it? Hey. I don't understand. Makes no sense to me. Um, so the Zulus are right, says MM. That is selfish. <laughs> Kids are mean. That kid at school will be dropped off by his grandpa. Yeah, but so what? Your grandpa's, please, are you joking? Robert De Niro takes his kid to school. You don't think all the other kids are going to shut the hell up and go, wow, it's Robert De Niro. Although he probably goes to a school with all sorts of other kids who also have all sorts of parents that are like, wow. Exactly. Kids with uh, three parents because they got some mitochondrial DNA. Because <laughs> they're being raised by thrupples. Yes, exactly. Uh, all right, so before we go to 7 o'clock and the burning platform, I just have to play this for you. This is my favorite voiceover artist of all time. I, I shared this briefly on my Instagram yesterday, but I don't know if anybody actually listened to the whole thing. So this is a guy who, <laughs> I don't know if you can decipher this or not, but I sent it to a bunch of my friends. Some of them responded laughing their backsides off. Some of them said, I don't understand what this person is saying. And some of them said, wow, you know, uh, the voiceover industry is really booming. Take a listen, and you tell me what you think. Pumi, are you ready? Okay, Barry, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All good. It's a carpet right TV. Yeah. Just take one, whenever you want. Carpet right has all the bargains for this bank on the big one, Dave. Banks, Minster, Shagpile and Linos. 15% off. Say a lens bank on the big one, Dave. Well, it's not bad. Not a bad start, yeah. Barry, but it just needs to be a bit clearer. Clearer? Yeah, maybe a bit okay. slower. Slower, okay. Should we go for take two? Yeah, take two. All right, whenever you want. Carpet right has all the bargains for this bank holiday weekend. Ex-Minster, Shackball and Rhinos. 15% off sale in bank holiday Monday. Yeah, Barry, it's just not that clear for the listener. Really? Know. Yeah, well, what's the problem? It's kind of difficult to understand what you're saying. Oh, I'll have another go. Right. Rolling. Is this take three? Okay. I think it's take three, whenever you want. Carpet writers, all the bargain for this bank holiday weekend. Actually, go straight down the liners. 15% off the Sire Bank Holiday Monday. Oh, Barry, I'm sorry. It's not really getting any better, is it? What? Which bit? Well, all of it, to be honest. Maybe we should do this line by line. All right. Do you think that would help? Yeah, let's have another go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. I love him. I want that guy to be our announcer on the show. That, that, that was terrifying. I went to him to give go. That was terrifying to see and hear. Pums, he's great. Don't you think he should have been the main? He should have been the announcer at the coronation. Yeah. Do you think he was there? That's what I wondered. Do you think he was at know. the coronation? <laughs> he's so awesome. I love that guy. And he's trying to tell, <laughs> he's trying to tell us about carpets. He goes, copyright. <laughs> is it fifty is it fifty percent or fifteen? I don't is know. 
That is anyone's <laughs> business. I mean, I don't even know what the cop is. He's like, X means to shag pardon. You learn how. He's so good. He's so good. I love him. <laughs> Gray is right. He does sound and look like a British Gwede. <laughs> the British have their very own tiger. Gareth, you've got 30 seconds to oh. tell me how good your party was on Saturday. Well, no, it wasn't really. Um, I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was very chilled. It was, it was very relaxed. It was very uh, friendly and family oriented. It wasn't anything explosive and exciting. You'll be pleased to know that I was out in the bush with a group of friends and I made all of oh, them yeah? watch the, I made all of them watch oh, the coronation wow. with me. <laughs> did, they, did they enjoy it? <laughs> uh, like some it? grumbling. There, there was some grumbling, but they, they, there was much, much to be learned. There were some grumbles, but we, we they, they sat through it and like troopers and, and learned a lot. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. I've, I've, you know, I've kind of already moved on. I thought I'd be very much more interested in this coronation than I was. I mean, we spoke about it last Thursday, but I've moved on. Mm. All right. Let us. Take a quick break when we come back. The burning platform. Yes, Canton will be with us and we will be joined. He is just none, arrived. Uh, very good. None other than the Honorable Nontembeko Boyce, who is the KZN Legislature Speaker and someone who I met just a short while ago in Kwamashu. She will be joining us and she will be on in just a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere. Very, very good stuff on the way. Bank Every time you listen to that 80s show, Tom Cruise lives another 10 years. Every Friday on cliffcentral.com, Paolo and Dory review movies, reminisce about old songs, remember childhood places that are now car parks, and say some outrageously rude things about Patrick Swayze's brother. That 80s show, new episode every Friday, live or as a podcast on cliffcentral.com. sit forever building the perfect plan yeah. or we can just go and do it right? and and build and evolve as we go so yeah I mean you know sort of the question of so so where do you start figure out one thing you want to improve from an outcome perspective not a let me do this part figure out what that outcome looks like what what does done look like and then work back from there right so okay I need better visibility of my accounting package my CRM my Billing platform, my mail server. <laughs> what? Yeah. I need better performance. Right? I need. I need to be sure that when I leave the office, or if I go away, things are going to carry on working. Cool. Let's understand that outcome. Then let's let's start looking at it from there. I'm Jakub Voigt, the CEO of Catalytic, and this is Unbundle. In this series, I help to demystify technology in the world of business. Join me as we explore how technology can make your business better. In this episode, can you manage without monitoring? We're chatting about monitoring of a business's ICT environment. We're chatting about what to monitor, why to monitor, and when to monitor. This week on the Auto Trader Podcast. A factory in Brazil, um, and they were recently busted for building replica supercars. I think we have a photo of one. Um, so if you look at this, this shape here, I mean, that's clearly a wow. Lamborghini. And specifically, that's the Riventon, um, kind of the features. It's, it's not identical, but I mean, to pass off as a replica, you can see how why this can be problematic. Did it they put like a Lamborghini a, badge on it? Put a Lamborghini badge on it. Um, the only difference is that they changed the engine. So, for instance, the I mean, look at look at look at that like that shop. It, yeah. It, Catch us every Monday at nine a.m. on YouTube and on Autotrader.co.za. All right. It is time, everybody, to get our morning off to the right start. 
Oh, I hear lots of background noise there. Damn, it's, it's, it's not me. <laughs> Canton. It's Canton and Ryan. There's Are Canton and being, Ryan over here being, I don't know being, what they're doing. Being loud and obstreperous. What else do you expect from us? <laughs> Especially at actually, this time of the morning. Uh, no, that is why we have you on the show, is to be loud and obstreperous. Right. Without wasting any time, guys, the burning platform, obviously, our, our chance to catch up on all the things that are going on in the news. We talk about politics. We talk about society. We talk about the economy. We talk about the world. We talk about the little things that uh, make us laugh and the things that don't, and obviously, the things that affect our lives the most. So this morning, I'm thrilled to have somebody on who I met just a short while ago, in fact, probably about a month, maybe a little more than a month ago. I encountered her at a community hall in Guamashu, where we were talking about uh, the, the great uh, Dr. Pixli Kaisagaseme and uh, his legacy. And this person impressed me enormously because, first of all, she was the first person I've seen in a long time who actually explained why people should vote for the ANC, which is a tall order, and she did it very well. But also because she's someone who um, – well, I was impressed by her forthrightness. So I was impressed by her ability to kind of – command the crowd and to and to stand her ground on, on various issues where there were some people who were quite hostile and there's some people who were very supportive. And I thought we've got to get this person on. First of all, it's always good to have someone representing the ANC. We had Dada Morero last year and after him, him being on the show, he became mayor of Joburg. Remember? So Yes, short, for a short period, but yes. It, this like, is the know. trend these days. This is right. the trend these days. <laughs> Who knows what might happen to Non Tembeko when she joins us now? She's Non Tembeko Boyce. She's the KwaZulu Natal Legislature's Speaker. And she's actually from the Eastern Cape Pumi, which is a very interesting story. You can get it to tell you a little bit of that as well. Um, but she became a uh, fast and furious member of the young ANC in KwaZulu Natal. And she's taken on various roles there, which she could tell us about as well just now. But she's um, currently a member of the PEC in KZN. She served as a councillor in the Ugu District Municipality, also worked on the ANC's KZN legislature, legislature Caucus as the manager. In 2014, she was sworn as a member of the legislature and deployed as Deputy Chief Whip of the ANC in the legislature. And in 2016, she became the Chief Whip. So following the general elections of 2019, she's been made the Speaker of that uh, KwaZulu Natal uh, legislature. She's the chairperson for the rules and programs committees. Um, she's also the chairperson of the CPA in KZN, which is interesting too. So we'll talk about all of those things, but let me welcome her to the show. Nontembeko, it's very nice to have you on and thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Gareth. Good morning to you and uh, to the rest of the crew. Good. Pumi, Pumi and Canthan are uh, probably going to ask you lots of questions. We're always pleased when we can get someone from the ANC on. And there's lots to talk about. What I do want us to try and stay away from is all the questions that we direct at people who have particular jobs in the ANC, um, you know, like Minister of Electricity, for example. We can't direct those at you. You're not responsible for that stuff. But I'm sure you have some points of view that you'd like to raise as well. I know people tend to uh, throw everything into a bundle and then push it to the ANC. But I'm, I'm sure that there are specific questions that you'd want to answer rather than general ones, which you aren't necessarily in the right position to answer anyway. So with that said, uh, let's talk about you for a second. Um, how does someone from the Eastern Cape end up being the speaker of the KZN legislature? And tell us a little bit about your political journey. I can answer that question first. You need someone <laughs> impartial who can mediate between the various factions in KZN. I'm a... <laughs> not really, not really. Stop <laughs> mansplaining her. Give her a chance. <laughs> Look, I'm no longer from the Eastern Cape. I was born in the Eastern Cape. So I then came to work in Guazulu Natal. You'd remember that once you... In the, in, in, according to the Electoral Act of South Africa, once you reside in a particular area, that's where you are eligible to vote and be a member and a resident. So since 1996, I've been residing here. I would go for holidays in the Eastern Cape, just like the case it is uh, with most migrant workers, mostly found in, in Gauteng. I then came, worked since 1996, and uh, the next elections that came 
of, two, of 1999, I was already a voter in KwaZulu Natal and an activist as a teacher in the South Coast. That's how I became a person of KwaZulu Natal because I wouldn't have afforded to go home every time before election, a day before yeah. election, or participate in the campaign. I, I felt that because I was staying at Izingolweni, I had to participate in the ANC campaign where I was living. That's how then I became a person of KwaZulu Natal and grew there as a young person. I was 20, 1996. So as I grew up there, they started to recognize me as part of the leadership, both in the ANC Youth League, in the trade union for teachers. I was a member of the South African Democratic Teachers Union, as well as the Young Communist League in the region. That's how then I ended up being at the provincial level. I started right at the branches at that time, 1997, when we started being active, it was, I think there was only one branch of the ANC in Izungulweni, the one at Shoba Shobane where I was teaching. Uh, we started there. We built many <laughs> branches, the leadership built branches, we grew, and here we are. Well, I mean, the ANC has had an interesting journey in KZN themselves as a party. I mean, we, we you know, obviously post 94. There was a lot of tension. In fact, pre-94, there was a lot of tension there between the IFP and the ANC, and things have changed considerably. I think the biggest the biggest change to the, the, the politics of KZN was probably the election of Jacob Zuma as president. And you can you could disagree with me on this if you like, uh, Nontebeko, but I'd like to hear your point of view on it anyway. But it seems to me that that shifted the political landscape in quite a dramatic way. And although there are still things going on, in KZN, which worry us, the factions that Canton's already uh, hinted at. What do you think that the main movements in politics in KZN are? The speaker, first of all, and as someone who's, who's watched it for a number of years. Yes, the, the, there was a lot of movement and transition in KwaZulu Natal. And I want to agree, uh, President Zuma played a great role in the transition, but it was a collective effort of the then leaders of KwaZulu Natal. He did not only start when he was a president of the ANC. You'd remember that for the longest time, he was an office bearer at a national level as a deputy secretary general, but still being a a provincial chairperson of the ANC, because KwaZulu Natal was still going through the reconciliation period. So himself and the leaders of the time, if you count the likes of comrade, a former premier of the province, Willis Mkounu, Dr. Zuelim Kize, Dr. Ndebele, Abobaba, Usipo Tabashe, the whole lot of that generation of leadership that was leading with President Zuma when he was chairperson of the province. They, they transversed a difficult period for the ANC in the province, but not only for the ANC sometimes. I say for the people of Wazulu Natal because the, 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 the reconciliation started much behind the scenes and they brought it before us to see when there was a time that we had the, 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 the floor crossing, to see people that were staunch, mm -hmm members and grown in the IF, uh, grow up in the IFP, coming back as members of the ANC and representatives of the ANC. It was a joint effort. But I must also pay credit to the leadership of the IFP at that particular time, because it took the two of them coming mm. together to embrace each other and have a common goal to see the end of violence and tensions in Wazulu Natal. That played a lot in the legislature of Wazulu Natal. By the way, Mpumi, before you move, there is even a book that was produced in the previous terms of the legislature, I think in the fourth term, that was saying the building of the Grand House. That was narrating how the House of Wazulu Natal in the times of Obabu Herikwala was used to mediate and uh, come to where we are. But President Zuma was leading, of course, because he was the chairperson of the province. Speaking of floor crossings, are you allowed to talk to us about the ongoing conversation of whether Umdanaga Pindangene is coming back to the ANC? No, that one is going to be spoken to by the spokesperson of the ANC in the province and the provincial secretary. But of course, there's been a media briefing recently that was done post our last PEC. 
where we were acknowledging the, as the PEC, we acknowledged what is being done at a national level. And as a province, I stand to say, we support it. We support the national leadership in trying to move us together so that Umdonoka Pindangene is able to get his wishes fulfilled, but also to totally heal the past. We agree where we agree. And if he becomes back to the black, green, and gold, where he came from as a member, he's a young lion. He grew up in the ANC Youth League. That is a discussion, is that, but that is for the ANC. Is is that though? Is is it is it a another move to uh, bring back into the ANC the numbers that it is losing? Are you hoping that that is going to be a precursor to some kind of a coalition with the IFP, or maybe even move people who are voting for the IFP to come and vote for the ANC? If it was started now. After the 2021 elections, I would I would think you are granted to think that way, boom. But having been in the even in the PEC from 2015, I know that it's an old discussion. And yourself, you have heard it. People in the ILC have heard it even way before. I think even way before the 2014 uh, national elections, it has been a talk that has been there. At that time, the ANC was not going down. So we started at a provincial level going down in the 2019 and then and, and the 2016 local government elections. But that talk has been old. And I want to say it has nothing to do with the fortunes of any of the two parties, but everything to do about the reconciliation and building a better KwaZulu Natal. Okay, but let's go there then, because is KwaZulu Natal demonstrably better in any way right now than it has been before. I mean, we've got sweet Jim Gary says, will is out here under Papa says. <laughs> huh. Just hold, hold on, K. <laughs> Just hold on, Kathy. <laughs> because Sweet Pea says, I live in KZN. It is a disaster. Literally sewage running down the streets. Constantly no water. Filthy streets. Uh, thuggery on the promenade. Assassinations rife. It is a disaster. So, you guys in politics, you talk about this stuff and you sit in the legislature and you have to make decisions about these things. But do you think people's lives have got better in KZN? We had those terrible riots just a couple of months ago. We've had natural disasters. It's been a really, really difficult time for people who have lived in that province all of their lives. And I don't think they could say with a straight face that their lives feel like they're improving. No, the lives of people in Guazulu Natal have improved greatly for the majority of the people of Guazulu Natal. But does that mean that there are no challenges? That would be a lie. There are challenges. There are challenges in service delivery. I, I take it, I've seen that uh, the Sweet Pea is speaking about the promenade. So I think he's a person who's living in the metro in Etewin, because that's where you have the promenade. Tina in Uku, we don't have such. But even in Uku, there are challenges there, especially when it comes to the issue of water. And There's even on the no other day. In South Broome for two weeks. Hello? In South Broome, they've had no water for almost two, two weeks. I am going to respond to you on the Oku issues of water. It's not only in South Broome that there's been no water. There's been no water for three weeks in a row in Kamalake, in so Machisim. So in 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 Hadi. now what do, what were the issues there when we became councillors in 2011 there were issues of the infrastructure that was aging but whilst we were still having the issues of the aging infrastructure in Uko, there came a time i hope Mbume, you heard about the time that there was sabotage in the infrastructure of Uko, <laughs> where there were people besting uh, pipes and <laughs> uh, going to the plants to, to burn the plants. There was that time. That is a reality that happened in Ugu. Now, I won't go to the detail. What have been done in Ugu? Last year in November, if you would remember, the National Council of Province wanted to come to Wazulu Natal, and we said as a provincial legislature, we will take them to Ugu where we brought in the Minister of Water and Sanitation, Minister Mtunu was in, in, in Port Chastin at Gamalake. What then followed 
was a change in terms of the water infrastructure that is there. When we met this week in the in the in the water and sanitation summit of the district, they they, they get that gathering they called that way. They had moved from where they are because now they are able to attend to the infrastructural issues because there are grants that have been unlocked from national. There are also issues of areas like deep rural herding. I will speak about herding which, because my constituency is also in herding. In Ward 8, there are areas where there is no water, but where you find that you can't even send a truck because it's two or three households behind a mountain and there's no river there. I mean, there's no road there. Now, they are also introducing with the new funding the issue of water tanks, I mean, of, of, of boreholes that will be made to be available as a temporary measure. So those are the strides to deal with water. But I am sure that the water and sanitation minister, when you call him, uh, I am sure my Wane would explain deeply because I am from the legislative no, but side. I, I, but go okay. to go It's to going to be, you know, it's going okay. to be easy to, to, to have it drilled down into this particular municipality, this particular thing. But what we're not having a conversation about is the fact that a lot of these, uh, of the things that you speak about, for instance, if we use the, the, the infrastructure sabotage, as you call it, is... There is a failing of a national government in that there is no policing, there's no security of all of that infrastructure, and that has then drilled down into a district level. And at national government, we have an ANC government. At local government, at, at, at provincial government, we have an ANC government. In some of those municipalities, we have an ANC government and all those three structures are not talking to each other they are not assisting each other it may be that you're talking to us about 12 years since 2011 to today in the ugu district right but what you're also talking about is that for 30 years guys for 30 years there has been opportunity to change all of the things that you are talking about all of the challenges people with no streets people with no boreholes people with no and we haven't seen that we haven't seen that on the mass scale that would have substantively made everybody's life better. I think, Pumi, when we want to be fair, you will first have to go and check the water connections that have happened in KwaZulu-Natal. You don't even have to go back to since 1994 or since 2004 because the ANC took over KwaZulu-Natal since 2004. There is a manifesto handbook of the ANC that will assist you of 2019 because it was tabulating the water connections. There are areas in Wazulu Natal that did not have water when the ANC took over in 2004. Those areas have water connections. The areas that you're speaking about of water that was sabotaged, the infrastructure, you know, a criminal is not like you and me and Gareth and Kenther, they won't go to the public space. Where there were water sabotages, it was in the private spaces where it was in the middle of farm owned by personal, I mean, by private individuals. Now, that is not a scapegoat. What is important is what has been done. We have said that those issues <laughs> are being attended to. But go through to Umzinyati district. Umzinyati district is in the north. There are issues of water that have been there forever in that particular district, Gareth. Since 19 and Azi, it has been governed by one party. It, it has been governed by one party and then there was a coalition in a particular but time when it got governed by the ANC. Because of the topography in that particular area, people of Umsinga, even today, are still having the water issues. Now, does that mean that there is no new people in Umzinyati that have gotten water? It's not true. They do have. That is why I say, generally, the state of KwaZulu Natal has changed since democracy. It might not have changed where I stay, because where I was staying, me and Bumi, we might have been staying in South Broome or we have been staying in Gamalake where there has been water before. But with the more people joining in the system, of course, there would be witnesses 
That is what we are going through, and we must attend to that. You know, Gareth, and, Gareth you, know, you know, sorry, one, of the, one of the things that, you know, in, in the scenario that we've got where, you know, we've got Madam Speaker as a guest on our show, and it would be rude for me to kind of bludgeon her into submission with, you know, the, the myriad range of problems that are fundamentally contradicted by all of the gobbledygook that she has been spouting. My parents live in Reservoir Hills. It's called Reservoir Hills for a very good reason. This is in Durban. It's called Reservoir Hills because at the top of the hill, there's a reservoir, which provides most of the water for the greater Itequeni municipality. They are literally less than a kilometer from the actual reservoir, and the pipes from the reservoir have not been maintained. So the level of gobbledygook that is coming out here right now, when there has been a fundamental failure to actually fix the basics of infrastructure, this has nothing to do with formerly privileged areas now complaining about the fact that water has been rolled out to the masses. Water needs to be rolled out to the masses. But the fact of the matter is that Itekweni is the economic hub of the province. It is also one of the economic hubs of the entire nation because Itekweni and Cape Town historically roughly have approximately the same uh, uh, gross domestic product. Now, with Itekweni not being able to provide the basics, even though it has an advantage at a number of other levels. For example, it doesn't get load shed as badly as the rest of the country does. Again, because this is a throwback to the fact that they suffered under the floods. Mm -hmm. But I was in, uh, in Durban for a period over the, the past couple of weeks. I was driving around. The place is a shithole. I cannot say it any differently. This is the town that I was born in. Under, under apartheid. This is the town where I grew up in. This is the town where under an ANC government during the Mandela era was considered to be the best run municipality in all of Africa. And what has happened since then? It has been looted. It has been pillaged. We, uh, under the ANC municipality, uh, under the ANC during the Mandela era, it had the best public transport system in the country. That public transport system was then sold off to an ANC crony who then looted and pillaged it. It was then bought back by the municipality at a massively inflated price tag. And it no longer functions at the level that it used to function. I used to be able to hop onto those minor buses from the town and travel to all... Pumi, uh, I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no. Okay, the city actually... I mean, it hosted the A1 Grand Prix. This place now is it, it's heartbreaking and what do we get the anc manifesto says this no it's unacceptable but maybe this is the opportunity um to to tell us why you believe that people should still be voting for the ANC, given all of the heartbreak, all of the disappointment, all of all of that. Why do you believe that people should still believe in your party? I, I will start with Kenzin because uh, when I was going to Etiwini, I was stopped, and I thought that uh, you don't want to hear about Etiwini. Uh, firstly, Kenzin, I think that. You say I, I speak about privileged areas. I, I always avoid using that name. I know, uh, but that's why I brought it up. It's not for political reasons. It's, it's not for political reasons. It's not for political reasons for me. Because I know that when you think someone is privileged on one aspect in life, there is an aspect in the life of that individual where that individual is <laughs> underprivileged. You spoke about reservoir hills and spoke about privileged areas. Now you are forcing me to compare reservoir hills to what is happening now in what 96, for instance, of Etiwini in Imbu Umbumbu. When you look at the connections and the number of people that have entered the system. But also you want us to forget that Mayor Kaunda, when he came in as a mayor and recently, spoke about the problems of Etiwini and told us post the coalition what they intend to do to correct those difficulties they are faced with. You want us to forget that even the ANC in the province 
even when it was a uh, in the previous term of the PEC, and the current provincial secretary, Ukomre Tupegim Dolo, had spoken about the interventions. You want us to even forget that the ANC saw that what is happening in Etewini in terms of service delivery needs assistance because, not only because of what you are saying that you are supporting, what was putting, but because we understand that the majority of the people of the province are residing in Etewini. I think that it's about 38% or so, around 40% people of KwaZulu Natal that reside in one area, which is Etewini. Now, when you look at that, the ANC had not neglected nor did what you are alleging, my brother. But solutions may come. Oh, no, 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 no. Tell me which, which part of what I said was, was uh, not factually correct. Just tell and me what I said. Let's have finished. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, you know, listen to what I say, even if you don't like it. I will listen to what you no, say because we no, all I have just to want, say it. You, you said that what I said was wrong. Just tell me one thing that I was wrong. Saying, just only one thing. Hmm. I am saying to you, what you are saying that the ANC is not doing anything. We are doing things. That is why Dr. Kesha Slumisi has been sent here to lead the intervention administratively in Etewin. When you go through section 139 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, firstly, you will understand that interventions in municipalities are done by the Executive Council. That is why they are sending that team that have specialists, including Dr. Sakif, to come and do the intervention because we realize when you do not realize that there's something that is not right, you will not do interventions. So on that, on that score, don't think that we are not seeing. And we have said there are challenges in Etewini. Mayor Kaunda has outlined the challenges. As okay. a person who is having a responsibility in the legislative side, if there was no intervention from government, that's when we're going to have an issue. Now they have intervened. Now coming to you, Mbume, why do, do I think that Mbume, starting with Mbume, don't speak about people out yeah. there, Mbume, Gareth, and Kenthin, still can go and vote for the ANC. I want you first to understand that the issue of deciding who to vote for from the side that I represent as a legislator is an issue of your right. You can choose to vote for who you vote for. But mm -hmm. when I say to people, go and vote for the ANC, I say go vote for the ANC because for me, that is the party in the Republic of South Africa that I've seen so far having changed the life of many people. There are difficulties, of course, we were told about difficulties even before we came into power that there would be difficulties. I have seen it self-correct in areas when it was not doing fine. Currently, the ANC even said to itself, it is going to go through the process of renewal because amongst us, firstly, as deployees of the ANC in government, there are some of us, it may be not them, but who are not necessarily doing what they should be doing in terms of the manifesto, because the manifesto is what we must strive to do, is the contract between the ANC and the electorate. I think that the ANC will continue to be a self-correcting organization, but will deliver. In areas where it is having issues, it will have interventions to correct the issues and bring itself back to cause. But I believe also the ANC is where I stand, one organization that believes in what President Mandela gave us in 1994, a government that is an open government. When he was speaking about the ability of public participation and having feedback, he said, we must build a different government that is open and is allowing the input for citizens. So 
it's amongst those areas that I believe we have to vote for the ANC. Now, coming to service delivery and changing the lives of the people, having the ANC pushed back. Mm -hmm. Have we had the citizens since 1994? I believe that it have done. When you go to look to the access into public education, the access to public education, especially post-metric, it has increased. But what has been lacking and what continues to lack is the issue of driving universities and higher education institutions to respond to the needs of the economy. The needs of the economy. You want we to have, but when you want to talk about eight hundred thousand oh, unemployed graduates in this country. But even 800, as we talk about access to education with no jobs for them. So, no, but even before we talk about access to education, according to Stats SA, let's talk about Peter Maritzburg, just in the Peter Maritzburg area. Only 33% of kids who start school finish school. So, what, 33% of kids who start what school finish school. What then is given as a reason? Then, and and, here, one, and Pumi, what then is given as a reason? Because we must, go back, we must go down oh, Pumi, to the reasons that are given by Stats SA. What is given as the reason? Because that report, we have it. What is given as a reason for the rest? What is accounted for for those that do not go through to grade 12 in Bume? What is it? The, what is it? Do I'm you tell us? Bume, because, because only 2%, because no, 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 only no, no, 2 of those people okay. end up hold in on. higher education. 53% so, and only 2% end know, up in higher education. On. Nontebeko, I'm going to ask you to answer that because you brought up how education is important, tertiary education. Yes, I'm, I'm still and, no, I, Gareth, I need to make a point around this tertiary education thing. Just yesterday, now, there's a Now, report. can I write is your it, question oh, down? Oh, can I write Bume's question down? Can I write Bume's question and yours, Gareth? Yes. Can I so, write Bume, uh, what was your question, my sister? She wants my to know question. why 3% of people in Peter Maritzburg, which is the capital of that province, it's where you sit in the legislature, why do yes. only 33% of the people finish school? I thought Mpume, who is bringing up the statistics of Stats SA, is going to say that. Unaccounted for on those people of the 33% are the people that live before metric and go to Tivet colleges. I thought Mpume is going to finish that. Unaccounted for are those who go to Tivet colleges. They are not accounted for. Go to Stats SA and see whether they are accounted for. They are not accounted for the percentage there. That is why when Status A came and presented to us on the 17th of February, we said, account for them because when you don't account for those who have gone to Tivet colleges prior to finishing metric, we are all not going to understand what is happening. Account for attrition. We want them to account for attrition because the yes, general... Right. You what, saying, what, do you, what does that even mean? Are you saying, are you, saying you don't know? How would I know if Status A does not say it? Because right. Mpume is acting as if he knows right. that they because all Because the ANC people. runs the National right. Department of Basic Education. Let's, so let's within just, the ANC. Uh, Nontembeko doesn't know, so let's move on to Canton's question. Uh, because yeah. otherwise, question is, report yesterday, KZN Education Department mm -hmm. to close more than 900 schools by 2028. This is in IOL yesterday. KwaZulu Natal's Department of Education plans to shut 255 small and non viable schools, 70 high schools, 185 primary schools during this financial year, 2023 2024, and a further 967 schools by 2028. This is oh, increasing access to education. I'm glad that they are actually now implementing the transformation of the schooling system. There is a policy in the Department of Education that is a transformation of the schooling system. <laughs> the transformation of the schooling system and the canteen starts from the fact that for a school to be called a primary school in the Republic of South Africa has to have a minimum number of learners. And in a high school has to have a minimum number of learners. There are schools in the province that we have found as the legislature that since 2017, they have had not less than the 150 that is required in, 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 in some cases. They have even had less than 20 learners. And those schools 
are now multi-grading. When a school multi-grades, it means that a teacher teaches more than one grade. If you want to get quality education, I am a product of multi-grading. I know the problems and the difficulties of that, and I've taught in a multi-grade. You are unable to give specific attention to the curriculum of that particular grade. At the beginning of the year, we do school functionality. I will make an example of a school we went to in, in Kosazana in, in King Drive. The school has got about 60-something uh, learners, but the teachers that are in that school are eight, so to say around eight. But when you come to the allocation of resources, the ratio of the learner to teacher is not allowing them to have so many. They should be having two. And if you have two, you can't have two teachers teaching from grade R up to grade seven. Now, it means that there is a disproportionate distribution of resources that have been invested in that area. Once the department has a policy that says, take these learners to the nearest school that is having enrollment and provide learner transportation. When they implement the closing of dysfunctional schools, because dysfunctional schools are schools without enrollment. It's not schools that are not governed well. The principals are very well behaving. But when some parents like Mpumi and me decides to take our learners, transport them from Ramsgate where we stay and, 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 and South Brook, transport them to Port Shepstein Town and leave the schools along the road because we're allowed to do that leave the schools along the road, there is Margate Primary and other schools. When that school starts having lower enrollment, that school will reach a level where it becomes dysfunctional. That is what is a dysfunctional school. Unless you are saying that we must leave the government or the department to employ seven teachers for seven learners, as long as they are in grade one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that will be a disproportionate distribution of resources because each teacher has to have an equal number, which is given by the PPN of number of learners to be in a class. Uh, but so, we so. also have unemployed teachers. Employ those teachers. Employ those teachers and deploy you them. Have money when you are employing teachers that do not have the number. I think that <laughs> let's be realistic. Let's be realistic. You can't say when you have tellers. I'm, 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 I'm taking you to a shop. You have a business. You have tellers who come and look for jobs. In a shop that does not serve, for instance, 100 people. And you say that you're going to employ 50 tellers. Who are they going to ring the, the tellers for? Teachers have a law, a law that is saying it is one is to 30 learners. You teach 30 learners in a class. So for one learner, no, it may be reasonable. So Please, maybe the teachers need to teach 15 learners so that they can give the attention that you spoke about before. But it okay, is done so in special the, schools. Special the schools. Learners for special well, learners with special right. needs. They the have answer different is different. clear. In other no, words, no, 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 you get given, they were given from 2017 to bring back your kids. Don't take your kids to the school in another township. Bring back your kids to this particular school. And they still, parents, gave birth. Imagine, children that were born in 2018 are in school. They are not taking them to those schools, taking them to other schools. So what do you think must happen? 
The reason teachers are staying at home, not working, it's because there's this disproportionate. And I, I am glad as a fellow teacher that those who are graduate teachers and staying at home, they know that for as long as there are resources that are wasted right. and not used properly, they will not get let's, employment. They have to be employed. Let, yes, Karen. Let's. I, I want to give you a chance to to plead the case. Like you, you know, you were asked by Pumi earlier, why should people vote? But give me an idea of the vision. You guys get together, whether it's the ANC or whether it's the legislature in total, right? And you have to plan what kind of a province you want KwaZulu-Natal to be in the future. What is the best outcome? How would you love to see KwaZulu-Natal flourish in the next couple of years? And what would you like to see done that, that, that you, may, you may be empowered to do, that other people might need to help you be able to do? But what would you like the vision of what a, a KwaZulu-Natal of five years from now should look like? Is there any discussion around that? Do you have an idea in your head? What would that be? Sell it to us because I want to be fair here. I don't want us to just pile on about schools and then about sewage and then about crime and then about the economic uh, destruction and all the rest of it. What kind of KZN do you want to see? Uh, thank you. Thank you about that, Gareth. The kind of KZN that I, when I sleep, I see is a KZN that uh, continues uh, to build itself, rebuild itself, mostly starting with uh, revitalizing the manufacturing uh, capacity of the province. I hope uh, Kenneth and Mpume understand that I'm saying revitalize, because I know that uh, most of the exploits of KZN before was through the manufacturing that was in Isitebe area. You go to Umnambiti area, you go to around Newcastle, but also the Mabek and also around Tegwini Jacobs and, and those areas. Uh, I think if, if the ANC through the economic development uh, uh, department can revitalize the, 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 the manufacturing ability. So how that will, the, how will the ANC do that? Tell us how the ANC will do that. Not through, don't, the problem, don't just the tell problem us the Karas, is that. that you ask me to respond something first in the middle of that, I must divert. And because Kenting laughs, I don't even know whether to respond to him or not. I, I don't know. Very you know, if I, if, to if the I don't have lights at my home, I will, right. uh, I will say there, I'm going to connect batteries Garrett's and fix it. Okay. No, 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 no. Let's we, answer Garrett's so question. You want, to see, okay. you want to see manufacturing improving. You want to see manufacturing. Uh, places like improve, cost improve, back online improve because they... The issues, improve the issues of security in Wazulu Natal, especially what we speak about uh, the, the, the capacity of our police stations. We have started work in that area, Gareth, because the province have decided while still waiting for, for national, because policing is at a national level, the government of the province have started investing through the yep. community safety. In, 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 in a project that will come in the next financial year of, of not only having security by hiring only police, but also having cameras. When you used to work in the city center of Etequini or in Port Shepstein CBD, there, there used to be cameras that belonged to municipalities and stuff like that. Now we want them to bring back those that will belong to the SAPS. I dream of that KwaZulu Natal, but also the type of KwaZulu Natal that I think will help is using to, to, to our benefit agriculture. There is a lot of arable land in KwaZulu Natal, and many people who own the land they have started to rather be swayed by fast and easy money by selling the land to the likes of Nondembego and Gareth who might be, buy, be buying sites to build. Probably if there is an education, which I believe oh, the current MEC Zuma has started, re-education of the people that are having the, the, the land on the importance and responsibility they have, not only to the land, I mean, to the people in their areas, but to the general population of KwaZulu Natal to build food security and creation of jobs. I think that then, if we get it right, firstly, in those, it would be easy 
to revitalize the economy of KwaZulu Natal. My that's my dream. It will rest with right. agriculture and manufacturing, but attend to crime. All right, I now, have a question uh, on that. I have a question well, I, on I just, that. I, sorry, Plums, I just want to give Canton a chance now because he did ask, you know, how does how do how do legislators like Nontembeko think that the economy will grow? Uh, when obviously we have major, major challenges in that respect too. So, Canton, complete your question. And even if you don't answer this, if you don't have an answer for it, Nuntembeko, at least for those people who are thinking the same thing, they'll they'll be heard. Canton, what did you want to say about how it happens? Yeah, my, my question is that, you know, we can talk about calling in the Minister of Economic Development to come in with a plan. I just want to know a single line item in this plan that has actually been assessed where you're able to say, for example, I've written in the past, one of the major issues that the Itekweni municipality has is that there are only four bridges that cross the Mgeni River. So the entire city is in gridlock for the entire day because all of the traffic that has to move from the business district of Mshlanga through to the CBD has to cross those four bridges. Those four bridges are uh, the beachfront uh, Ellis Brown Viaduct, it's you know, the Athlon Bridge, it's the Connaught Bridge, and it's the N2. Those are the only four bridges that go across the river. None of and, those and, bridges and, and have a been very built since None of them No, and all of, those are apartheid, all of those are apartheid era bridges, yes. And the single thing that could be done in Itekweni right now that could immediately transform the city is to build additional bridges across the river to allow for the flow of traffic and goods and people from the commercial district of Mshlanga through to the CBD and to the ports and so forth. So that is a very specific example where one can say, put in a bridge, it's going to allow for the free movement of goods that's going to do uh, generate X number of jobs immediately as a direct result of that. What I hear coming from you, Nantebek, very simply is, we are going to wait for the Ministry of Economic Development to give us a plan. And I'm saying, I want to have a plan that actually has line items. And those line items have to say, if we spend the following amount of money on doing this particular thing, what is going to result from that is the ability of businesses to thrive. And therefore, there is going to be an additional injection of money into the economy. For example, again, one of the projects that was supposed to have been happened, it was tabled close on 20 years ago by the ANC, was the idea of a high-speed rail link that was supposed to happen between uh, King Shaka International Airport and Peter Maritzburg. That project was approved, the, the budget was passed, it never happened. Why did it never happen? That in of itself could have transformed the economy of the entire region, simply because of the fact that you've got the Dubai trade port that's right next to King Shaka, and the ability to then move goods rapidly from the, uh, the hinterland through to the Dubai trade port and from there to be able to ship uh, uh, air freighted to the rest of the world. Those are very specific examples. Instead, all I'm hearing is we are waiting for the Ministry of Economic Development. You have all of these things that have already been approved. They have not been acted upon. Why? Hmm. Firstly, I think, Kenzin, you and I hear things differently. I spoke about the department in the province on the outrolling of the of the of the plan. You're speaking about the ministry. Uh, you're speaking about national. I think it's your problem. Why am I saying the department? Yes, I'm speaking about the department. Why am I saying I'm speaking about the department? It's because uh, Gareth, last month in April, uh, on the 18th of April to be specific, MEC Duma came to the legislature of Wazulu Natal to table his budget speech for the current financial year. Those matters that I'm speaking about that I dream of were part of the budget speech. Already, as we are speaking with you, MEC Duma has been going through districts. That is what the government is doing in the province because the, you, you're not going to sit here and say, I dream like this and it happens. What you have to do is understanding district per district, how does it play its role here? That's what the government, the department is doing. 
The legislature through the portfolio committees, there are two portfolio committees that are responsible <coughs> for the economic development. It's the environmental uh, uh, affairs and conservation and also the economic development portfolio committees are going to be meeting with the MEC at the end of this first quarter because we are in the first quarter now of, of end of the first quarter of, of the financial year, where they are going to be finding out how much progress is made. Of course, I may not have said the Department of Transport have to build roads, but I thought that we all understand you need a road infrastructure network. That is why currently the... Department of Transport is building a bridge that connects in the south, in the south of KwaZulu Natal, three municipalities. It is connecting Rengonyeni, Umzumbe, and Umuzuabantu. Those three municipalities in the area that they are getting connected, it's where firstly there is farmlands in the south, in the in those areas of the of the of the bridge. And people have had to, when they want to transport their own uh, harvest, had to go via the main old road that goes past Harding, go to Port Shepstein and stuff. Now they no longer have to go via Isandombe and come to Port Shepstein. Right. When that uh, bridge is finished, they will no, finish. No, they will come to that. In the interest of time, I'm sorry, because you are giving us specific examples now, but it these Even are slim giving, giving me specifics of Etewini. I want to give sure. you specifics in the province. That's what I'm doing. Sure, can't fair give enough. you of Etewini. So can't I give you as well? Well, you've just given because us one now. We have, and, we have 11 districts here. All right. And you're telling me there are more? That's fine. I take your word for it. But for me, before we go, because we've only got four minutes left, so I don't want to waste this opportunity. Um, Pumi, what did you want to ask? Because I cut you off just now. I wanted to ask about people. If you believe you have the people who can deliver on these visions, you know, what we're also seeing, and yesterday I read an, a, a very interesting uh, report by Global Initiative about the rise of political killings again in South Africa, and most of them concentrated in KZN. You know, you have, and, and being in the PEC, you probably have a, a more global view of the number of individuals who have been targeted, who have been killed, and we see it. You know, we also see it in our news. You have a councillor in Eteguini who is currently um, in prison awaiting trial for killing his predecessor. That says to me that you have people within your organisation who are not safe from each other, who cannot trust each other, who are fighting each other, whether it is for positions or whether it is for beliefs, I do not know. You probably have a better view. But do you believe that those people are able to deliver all of these wonderful things that sit in your, manifest, in your manifestos and in your planning if they themselves within your organization, you cannot work together? I firstly will not comment on what you are drawing me in into the issue of people waiting a trial on, on, on certain dates. Definitely will not comment. But do I believe that the people that are in the positions in the ANC will be able to deliver? Yes, I believe so. Why do I believe so? It's because the ANC is, is, is unlike the show we are in. Where Mbume will think her own thing and want it to be done, can then ask about his own area, because the ANC is, is, is centralizing planning. Now, when there is a plan that is generally agreed upon, they then look who's better suited for that. And then they allow that person to go and execute that. So I believe in the ability of the ANC. But aren't we having issues of people who are getting in positions and don't deliver? We do have that. And I alluded to it earlier when I was saying, why vote for the ANC? The ANC will be able to renew itself and remove those that they feel that are not delivering or responding to what is needed to be done at the particular time. That's why I believe that the ANC will continue 
to not only bring hope, but to actually exercise what it is promising to the people. But it will not be at the same speed. It will be not at the same time. Of course, it will not be addressing the issues in the exact area where you want it to address at that particular time, because the ANC is leading the society. We have to address issues across All right. the I, area I, that I, we are in. I hope that that uh, nobody here feels hard done by because I think we we wanted to have you on Nontembekwa and to have, give you a chance to speak and to give you a chance to plead the case for the ANC in KwaZulu Natal. Which I mean, you know, despite all the misgivings that the people who think we're too nice to you and the people who think that we weren't uh, nice enough are going to have, um, it's good to have someone from the ANC on because, as I said at the beginning, it's very rare that the ANC even stands and talks on platforms like this because very often they just accept that people are going to vote for them anyway. You've come on here. You've explained what you think the ANC is doing right, especially in KwaZulu-Natal. Pumi and Kanthan, you've you've had a fair go of this. I know we could have carried on for another hour, but unfortunately we're out of time. Any closing remarks, uh, Nontembako, before we let you go and, and then Kanthan <clears throat> and Pumi? No, uh, uh, my closing remarks is Firstly, to thank you, uh, Gareth, for uh, giving us this platform. And uh, there's nobody who can say they are hard done because you go to an interview, it's not like you are visiting your uncle's uh, homestead. Uh, the, you are not my uncles. You have a responsibility to give yes. things out there to the people of South Africa so that they make informed choices. This is your work. This is what the ANC stands for. The ability to speak your mind and allow people to be informed. You've done that. But I want to say to the people of South Africa, the African National Congress, from where I'm standing, is still the party to vote for come 2024 general elections. Thank you for the opportunity. But you did not ask us about the work of the legislature. You kept concentrating we on some the ANC. I asked you to ask us about what we are doing as a legislature in terms of the mandate. Bye bye, Kevin. You know what we'll do? We'll have to get, we'll, we'll just have to have you back. Uh, to you'll have to go to Buya, Sisi. Buya again. Buya. Now we have programs in the legislature of Kazulu Natal. We have to make people understand what is the work of the legislative arm of government. Because people confuse us with the executive as if we have to go and build roads. No offense meant, Kenzie. As if the legislative arm has to go and build roads. As if we have to go and build schools. We are the lawmakers. We do oversight. We do public participation. I loved your program. Right. Thank you very much, Nandembeko. Uh, Kanthan, Pumi, you've got next week and, and maybe some weeks in the future that we can tackle some more of these things and hopefully we'll have more people from the ANC like Nontembeko back on. In the meantime, I'm afraid that's all. So if you're angry because you didn't get the answers you wanted, you'll have to just join us next Thursday for another episode. And if you're satisfied, then send us an email and we'll pop, we'll pop <laughs> into Nontembeko as well. All right. Have a, have a happy 